Kelly, please. Ishak, have you discussed the crisis in the Middle East with Ursula von der Leyen? Um, obviously, we're all deeply concerned. And I see that she actually put out a tweet saying she was very concerned about the situation in Israel and Gaza. Quote, I condemn indiscriminate attacks by Hamas on Israel. Civilians on all sides must be protected. Violence, violence must end now. Uh, end of tweet. Absolutely no mention, though, of the horrendous acts being carried out by Israel, who are doing absolutely so much killing of innocent children in Gaza, children who don't have anywhere to flee to. She doesn't seem to mention this in what she's communicating, or the efforts to evict Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem. We know Israel doesn't really care about condemnation. Words from the Irish government have very little impact, unfortunately. But have you discussed it? with uh, Ursula von der Leyen or Charles Michel or Joseph Borrell at the need for meaningful sanctions uh, with Israel? Or can you enlighten us in any discussions you've had beyond those three as to what sanctions are being proposed or being looked at for this absolutely horrendous acts that are being carried out by Israel uh, as we speak? Deputy Boyd Barrett. No, Deputy Breed Smith. Uh, Taoiseach, um, thanks for your report, but I note that you didn't mention any discussions on climate change. Um, I'd just like to remind us that yesterday the International Energy Agency gave its darkest warning yet. Exploitation and development of new oil and gas fields must stop this year, and no new coal-fired power stations can be built if the world is to stay within safe limits of global heating and meet the net zero emissions by 2050. My concern, Taoiseach, is that although I'd love to be in a position to welcome the announcement yesterday by the um, Minister Ryan on behalf of the government in relation to LNG, LNGs, I'm not, because I fear that the government, like the EU, is speaking out of both sides of its mouth. You tell us that that you can't ban fracked gas because it's an EU-wide issue, and yet you say the government is against LNG terminals, but you won't ban them because there's a review of energy. Can you tell us that, at a minimum, the Minister for Housing and Planning will amend the law to ensure that new fortress energy, for example, is stopped in its tracks in having discussions about an LNG terminal at Shannon? Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Paul Murphy. Thanks, Ken Corla. The, the statement of the EU Commission President that she condemned indiscriminate attacks by Hamas on Israel was scandalous. No mention of the ethnic cleansing in East Jerusalem. No mention of the pogroms being carried out by right-wing Israeli activists, far-right activists in uh, Israel with the backing of state forces against Palestinians no mention of the bombs raining down on Gaza, not even the kind of mealy-mouthed uh, false equivalence that the Taoiseach himself likes to engage in. It shows that the official international community, following the lead of US imperialism, is fully on the side of the Israeli regime, a regime that is a deadly threat to all Palestinians and which is an enemy to ordinary Israeli Jewish working class people. But the point I would make is there is another international community out there. It was seen on the streets around the world last Saturday, a global movement of resistance, of solidarity and of support for what increasingly is looking like the emergence of a new third intifada in the Middle East, you, which Deputy. by mobilising people from below can defeat the occupation. Deputy Mary Lou MacDonald. Recorder. Yes. Uh, Representative. Deputy McLaughlin. Yes. Um, Taoiseach, back in the 80s, Ireland led the way against the South African apartheid regime, starting with the Duns workers, and then Ireland were the first country to put in place sanctions uh, against the South African apartheid regime. Human Rights Watch recently published a report comprehensively demonstrating that Israel is an apartheid state. This follows the report from the respected human rights organisation, Beth Salem. Our government know this. That is the context to the slaughter that is happening right now. 181 Palestinians have been killed, 1,200 injuries, 34,000 people displaced, 40 schools operated by the UN are now being used as shelters, 18 high-rise high towers destroyed, 350 buildings. When are our governments going to return 
to the leadership that we showed in the 80s? When are our people going to have a government that will do what's right and what we feel about this crisis? Thank you, Deputy McLaughlin. Deputy Richmond is not with us. Deputy Mick Barry is not with us. Uh, Deputy Keanu Callaghan. Taoiseach, uh, have you raised at a European Union level the need for support for the International uh, Criminal Court to investigate potential war crimes in Gaza, uh, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem? And if you haven't uh, raised that, uh, will you? Thanks. Taoiseach. Um, first of all, um, as I said yesterday, um, I'm very, very clear uh, that the violence in Gaza has to stop. Uh, the, the, I do believe uh, Hamas should stop firing rockets uh, as well, um, and, and that has killed people. But equally, I've been very, very clear uh, that the response from the Israeli government has been wholly disproportionate and wrong. Uh, it's been ruthless and brutal. Uh, you cannot bomb Gaza without killing innocent children. Um, innocent families uh, and, and civilians. Uh, I'm very clear about that. That is, that is my position. It's been my position for a long, long time. Um, and uh, in, in my view, uh, the, the key to this is it, it ultimately uh, has to be negotiations around the two-state um, solution. But the behaviour of Israel over recent years has made that more and more challenging and more and more difficult uh, in, in terms of uh, settlements, uh, annexation, uh, of land um, and, 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 and so forth. And there has been very little moderation in, in recent times or engagement uh, in terms of getting a settlement uh, in uh, the, the Middle East. And also, uh, I have to say that notwithstanding, Ireland has strong views in this, and Ireland always had strong views and put forward strong views. In fact, it was the late Brian Lenihan Sr. as, as a Fianna Fáil Minister for Foreign Affairs, who was the first minister, I think, in Europe to recognize uh, the Palestinians' right to a homeland. Uh, and we've been very consistent as a party uh, in that regard. And when I was Minister for Foreign Affairs myself, I visited Gaza in the aftermath uh, of a war there uh, to witness the devastation at first hand. But what I also witnessed and reflected on was the European Union's strong support of UNRWA, in particular the United Nations uh, <coughs> Relief Organization, which provides a range of supports uh, to Gazans and to uh, Palestinians on the West Bank, from education to social supports to economic supports. Um, and that needs to be acknowledged, but it never gets acknowledged in the debate. It's always one of condemnatory of stances that the President of the Commission might take, but no one ever on the far left ever acknowledges Europe isn't an imperialist um, power or anything like that. Uh, and there's this constant negativity about everything Europe does without balancing it with some of the positives that Europe does. Uh, and Europe has been overall a force um, for positivity in the Middle East, underpinning a lot of economic and social supports and government supports to try and help to get um, uh, the capacity uh, for self-governance um, going. Um, and, and it's my view that notwithstanding, and there are different perspectives across the 27 member, EU member states, let's not pretend that there aren't. Some are historic, some relate back to history. Uh, that is the reality. Uh, it's easy to stand up in the chamber here and sort of say, uh, and lambast, lambast the union as it was uh, a coherent whole in terms of this issue. It's not. It's not one coherent entity on this. It's, it brings together a consensus view. Uh, Ireland's view is very strongly one uh, that the type of uh, you know, behavior by the Israeli government wholly disproportionate and wrong. Likewise, we're equally of a view that Hamas should not be firing indiscriminately uh, into Israel, threatening uh, innocent lives. No one so far who has spoken, I think Barbara, Deputy Kelly maybe, has, has condemned that uh, and said that was wrong too, because it is wrong. Uh, and it's been wrong all, all along the way. Uh, and Hamas has enjoyed support from other regimes as well, um, who would be far better off not doing that, uh, because this can only be resolved uh, in, in, a peaceful, in, in a peaceful way ultimately because people have to coexist and people have to live in a shared space. Um, and what's been going on for, for far, far too long is utterly unacceptable. Um, Ireland's role, in my view, is to work as best we can as the small nation that we are uh, to see can we help to persuade others to move towards resolution. And of course, I fully accept uh, the public in Ireland are very, very uh, seized by this. 
uh, issue and have been consistently over the years. And I understand that. There's a, an innate sense of for justice and fair play in, amongst Irish people. And that's what we want for our Palestinians um, in particular uh, and, and, and their right um, uh, to, to, to a homeland. Uh, and um, so, so uh, that, that, that's our position. And the Minister for Foreign Affairs attended the EU um, foreign ministers meeting earlier this week where uh, agreement and consensus was reached on the need for a ceasefire. And that in itself wasn't uh, easy. Um, but consensus did emerge ultimately um, in, 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 in relation uh, to that. I haven't spoken to President von der Leyen yet, but we are having a council uh, meeting on, on Monday uh, and Tuesday, Monday evening uh, and Tuesday. Uh, there's a range of issues already on the agenda, uh, but we will obviously be raising this issue um, also, and, and the foreign ministers have spoken um, in, in, in relation um, uh, to it. Eight, Taoiseach. Just, just, just make sure I got to be, sorry, Deputy Breed Smith raised the, the issue of, of sorry, the yeah, gas yeah. Um, and the, the climate change. And, uh, 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 Minister Eamon Ryan, uh, the, uh, the cabinet uh, passed this week, um, a significant statement that will emerge from Minister Eamon Ryan in relation to the importation of fracked gas uh, into the country and outlining the, uh, the government's position um, in relation to that. Um, and you are right in terms of the EU legal framework doesn't facilitate the passing of domestic law that would contravene uh, EU law, but the statement is a strong statement uh, which will uh, have influence, you know, have impact in terms of planning and so on. Thank, thank you, Taoiseach. We move now to question number eight. Kian I propose to take questions 8 to 13 together. A policing service for our future, uh, APSFF for short, is the government's plan to implement a report of the Commission on the Future of Policing in Ireland. As recommended in the Commission's report, implementation of the plan is being overseen by a dedicated programme office in the uh, Department of Antigua. The Policing Reform Implementation Programme Office uh, monitors progress um, on the uh, strategy, uh, supports the work of the Implementation Group on Policing Reform, and keeps the high-level steering board on policing reform and government apprised of progress uh, being made. The Programme Office has been resourced with appropriate expertise in the areas of project management, policing, justice, and public service reform. A policing service for our future is a living document which was reviewed and updated um, by the Policing Reform Implementation Programme Office as required to maintain ambitious but realistic commitments, timeframes and milestones. A policing service for our future is broken down into four stages of implementation, namely the building blocks, which is phase six months duration, the launching phase, again of six months duration, the scaling phase of 18 months um, duration and the consolidation, 12 to 18 months duration currently envisaged for that. The first two phases of a policing service for a future phases, uh, the building blocks and launching phase have been completed and much has already been achieved. For example, the rollout of a new operating model for an Garda Shikana designed to streamline Garda administration and to provide a more visible, responsive and localised policing service to communities nationwide. An Garda Shikana has established and strengthened resourcing of a human rights unit and re-established the Strategic Human Rights Advisory um, Committee. The National Security Analysis Centre has been established. The rollout of over 3,250 mobile data stations have been deployed as part of Angora Shikana's mobility project. The development by Angora Shikana of an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Strategy Statement and Action Plan 2020 to 2021. And recently, Angora Shikana launched their three year Garda Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which will see the introduction of additional health and wellbeing supports. There has also been progress on legislative reform. Government has recently published the general scheme of the landmark policing, security and community safety bill, which provides for the most wide ranging and coherent reform of policing in a generation. And the general scheme of the Garda Shikana digital recordings bill, uh, which concerns the use of recording devices, including body worn cameras. Progress continues to be made also in relation to the codification of legislation defining police powers of arrest, search and detention. These measures and achievements represent only some 
of the wide range of uh, actions being progressed under the strategy, and further detailed information on the implementation of the reform program is available on uh, government.ie. Progress since early 2020 has been impacted as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The third phase of the implementation of a policing service for our future, the scaling phase, was originally scheduled to commence in early 2020. However, as the scaling phase was being finalised, COVID-19 and the response required became a factor to be considered. I've been encouraged to see the responsiveness and flexibility shown by Ngarda Shikana in dealing with the demands of this unprecedented situation. The third phase of a policing service for our future, the scaling phase, commenced in October 2020 and is published on government.ie. This is the critical phase of the programme of reform during which the programme gains momentum. The delivery of the majority of the actions will be started or executed during the scaling phase. The IGPR and PRIP audits the office have been and continue to be actively engaged with key stakeholders to ensure continued momentum on reform insofar as possible in the current circumstances. Thank you, Taoiseach. Uh, Deputy uh, Park McLaughlin. Taoiseach, uh, as you will be aware, the last uh, Dáil and Shannad uh, voted uh, four motions calling for a public inquiry into the circumstances that led to the death of uh, Shane O'Farrell uh, in August 2011. Uh, rather than implement the will of the Dáil and Shannon, the then government uh, introduced a scoping exercise led by Judge Hockton. Now, that was to have been completed by May of last year, then September, then December, then March, and then April. So, the delay, uh, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, is causing distress, ongoing distress to Shane's family. Uh, it's been protracted, it's unjustifiable at this stage. So I'm asking you, Taoiseach, to assure the family that this will be continue, uh, completed as soon as possible and that a decision on a public inquiry will not be delayed any further after that. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Alan Kelly. Shia Khan, as we all know, has undergone massive reforms in recent years, badly needed. Uh, one of them was moving the promotions and appointment system of Angarda to under the remit of an independent oversight agency, which we believed was absolutely essential. As you know, the Labour Party uh, set up the police and authority. It demanded it was set up in order to take away these appointments uh, from uh, the uh, Commissioner. Having an independent body making senior appointments is something we really fought for. The Commission on Policing has recommended the reversal of this. And we believe this is a fundamental mistake and something we'll oppose passionately. My colleague Brendan Howland has been to the fore on this. Our main concern is the removal of the appointment of senior Garda officers from the policing authority and restoring it to the Garda Commissioner. We know where this has got us before. I note the way your programme for government has taken on some of the uh, Commission's report put into your programme for government. But I would ask you, and I'm absolutely sincerely asking you, to reconsider this and look at this. Uh, we believe the appointments works much better. It's transparent and focused when it's with an independent body for senior people in a Garda Síochána rather at, than at the discretion of one person, namely the Commissioner of the day. And we urge you to relook at this. Thank you, Deputy Kelly. Deputy Breed Smith. Margaret, uh, Taoiseach, your uh, statement looked very much at the policing service of our future. But I think we do also have to, in order to reform the future, look back at the past, and in particular the past record of GSOC. Uh, Sinn Féin have already referenced the inquiry uh, on behalf of the family of Shane O'Farrell, and I want to talk about two other outstanding issues on behalf of families. It's, it's um, invariable when somebody dies at the hands of in, in, either in police custody or directly at their hands, it's invariable that they're from a working class background, and that will be noted throughout the history of the state. But Terence Wheelock died in 2005 in police custody. The report from GSOC, the investigation by GSOC, was completely unsatisfactory to the family. And likewise, thus far, since New Year's uh, Eve, the George and Kencho family are very, very dissatisfied, frustrated and disappointed with the behaviour of GSOC. And so I want to ask you, Taoiseach, is it sufficient that Gardaí investigate Gardaí, particularly in cases where working class people like Terence Wheelock and George and Kencho have died at the hands of the Gardaí? 
Thank you. Deputy Smith, Deputy Murphy. Thanks, Ken Corla. Taoiseach, it's reported that yesterday the Cabinet agreed to seek to extend the sweeping Garda emergency powers to November, with a possible extension all the way to Fe February 2022. Shamefully, while political parties have been exempted from the ban on gatherings, workers' pickets and socially distanced protests have been effectively banned for over a year now. Recently, we saw taxi drivers threatened with criminal action if they went ahead with their planned car cavalcade, even though every protester would have been inside their own car. On Monday night, we saw the police, the Gardaí, being used yet again against the Debenhams uh, protesters. We saw the IPSC being threatened with prosecution if they went ahead with last Saturday's protest in solidarity uh, with Palestine. Right now, 60 people can be sitting together on a bus. Hundreds are gathered in factories, shopping centres and beyond. But if they're holding a placard rather than a shopping bag, they face criminal action. That is shameful. My question is very simple, Taoiseach. Will you scrap this draconian uh, imposition and ban on the right to protest? Deputy Mick Barry, please. Taoiseach, uh, 20 years ago, Amnesty uh, Ireland carried out what might have been the first large-scale survey of Ireland's black and ethnic communities. 54% polled said they did not feel confident to report a racist incident to a Garda. 20 years on, how much has changed? I note the recent survey conducted by the Youth Against Racism and Inequality Group interviewing uh, people of colour and travellers 35% said that they had had the experience of being stopped by a Garda for no apparent reason. 45% reported feeling humiliation after such an incident. 42% reported feeling fearful after such an incident. So what steps are the government prepared to take to address this situation? And uh, has there been any change in thinking whatsoever around the uh, repeated call from the Enkencho family that rather than a GSOC inquiry, there should be a full independent public inquiry in relation to uh, the killing of that young man. Ishuk. First of all, um, this is Deputy O'Loughlin's question, uh, Amber Loughlin's question, sorry. Um, I, I, I'm, I want that scoping review completed as soon as possible. I, I think it's been a very very traumatic journey for the family of Shane O'Farrell, uh, um, and I've been in touch on an ongoing basis. I know Deputy McGuinness and others have raised this consistently in the House. Um, and the scoping reviews can be effective uh, in, lead, you know, in terms of subsequent uh, in inquiries also. Um, I don't know whether COVID is a factor here uh, in, in, in the delay in getting the review completed. Um, but I have, you know, I have spoken to the, to the Minister for, for Justice in relation to this, but obviously once the reviews start, we can't interfere, you know, in terms of the actual review itself. Or, but, but we do understand uh, the need to bring this to uh, a conclusion and, and, and to take decisions in relation to it. Uh, Deputy Kelly raised an issue that has been the subject matter of ongoing political debate um, in terms of the the differences between the last, you know, the, the Labour Fine Gael government when you brought in the policing authority and, and particularly in terms of the role of the policing authority in terms of the appointment of senior positions, whereas the Commission on the Future of Policing took a different view um, and uh, put forward an alternative view. Now, I had discussions with the Commission, as I think as many people had, uh, when, when they were doing their, its work. They were of a view, by the way, that there was a multiplicity of bodies to which the Gardaí had become accountable to, ranging from the Oireachtas right across, and there needed to be some streamlining um, of, 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 of this. Well, it's, it's part of the, the, the issue in some respects. Um, but uh, you know, we, I'm of a view that if we establish a commission to do a wide-ranging examination of the Garda Shikana with a view to preparing it for the future, uh, there's always a difficulty in, 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 in just picking the pieces that you like, uh, you know, as opposed to the overall um, coherence of the of, of, of the of the of the recommendations of the commission. So, um, I, I'm, a, I'm of a view that we should uh, give the commission's recommendations uh, the opportunity uh, and, and, and to uh, really drive them through and get them implemented. Because leading on to subsequent questions, you know, 
Um, it seems to me that other deputies in the House, you know, Deputy, um, and I, I, Deputy Smith raised GSOC, uh, the Turnsuilok case, and Inchenko family, George um, Inchenko family. And again, we have to, I said this last week, we, we do have to create proper independent processes for investigation. Now, GSOC is one such process. Um, everything can't become a public inquiry either. Because we know how long the, the public inquiries can take. They can take years. Um, and uh, yeah, so we all need to reflect on this a bit. Like ultimately, you've got to have faith in our services. And we've got to strengthen the capacity of our services to serve in according with the principles and policies that we lay down here in the Oireachtas. And that means constant interaction um, with, with the authorities and the management bodies and that there's proper internal accountability structures and external accountability structures. Um, and I think there's a, ch there's a challenge there for all of us because, you know, there's a, and we're all, I, I've been a parliamentarian like, like the, all of you, and we all call for specific investigations or specific inquiries. There needs to be a systemic approach here that's robust and that's resilient and that's independent. Um, Deputy Murphy uh, surprised me. He's, he, he's at, at attacking, he seems to be very anti the Garda. I think you were very anti Garda approach, don't know what it is, um, but you're constantly negative about on Garda Shikana, and I'd have to disagree with you. Also, I'm confused as to what your position is in relation, you're saying there should be large gatherings, be called, although you, you might call them protests or whatever, in the middle of COVID, and at the same time you call for zero COVID. That doesn't tally. That's, and the, and the Garda have been put in an unenviable position of having to implement Yes, very restrictive public health measures, and they are restrictive. You wanted to make them even more restrictive. Yes, so you wanted to make them more restrictive. You wanted to make travel virtually non-existent. Uh, you wanted uh, all shops closed. You wanted all hospitality closed. You didn't care anything about the rights of people in hospitality. You said this. You accused us of, 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 sort of yielding to the lobbies. You call them lobbies. You don't call them people. You don't say that they're people with human rights. Who, who have interests as well, who, who are legitimately entitled to articulate their view. You just ignore them and say they have no rights. Gardaí are all wrong. Gardaí are oppressors. Um, and I think that's wrong. That's not a balanced um, approach. Uh, I think the, the, the legislation will be debated in the House. Um, I would have thought you were supportive of the legislation because it enables us to restrict the, the, the journey of the virus. That's the, most, that's the crucial part of it all, to keep the numbers down and to try and get some semblance of, of normality, reduce uh, severe illness and reduce um, mortality and hospitalizations and ICUs. That's the purpose of the legislative framework. But we don't want that going on forever. Uh, but the powers are still necessary. We've just witnessed the Indian variant in the United Kingdom, for example. So we have to be constantly on alert in relation to what could become super spreader events, which you seem to want to encourage now, and more generally. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the Deputy Barry's point, the, the Gardaí, in my view, Deputy Barry, are rooted in the community. And the vast, vast majority of the Irish people trust on Garda Shikana. I think that has to be said. If one was to listen and play back the last 20 minutes, one would think that on Garda Shikana was an oppressive force out to do down uh, the community. It is not. It is rooted in the community, and its policies and procedures are designed to work with people, to encourage compliance, particularly in relation to public health, uh, to engage with people. Its last resort is to resort to penalties. Um, and that has always been its position. More broadly, in terms of the reforms, the objective of the policing reforms is to embed the Garda Shikana in the community uh, in a positive way. And I've witnessed in working class areas, and Deputy Smith witnessed working class areas, for the last 20 or 30 years, the Gardaí have led the way in some very disadvantaged areas by developing community buses, for example, driving the buses to Thank sporting you, occasions with kids who had challenges. Uh, Gardaí have done a lot of unsung work uh, quietly in the background for many disadvantaged, disadvantaged working class youths. Okay, we need to conclude, Taoiseach. That Thank needs to you. be put on the record too and acknowledged. Now, uh, we move nextly to Question 14, please. 
John Cord, I propose to take questions 14 to 27 together. The economic division of my department supports me and the government in developing and implementing policy across relevant areas to support sustainable economic development, including job creation, infrastructure, housing and climate action, and social dialogue. This work is particularly focused on ensuring a coordinated approach to the delivery of the programme for government and issues that cut across multiple departments. The Division supports the work of the Cabinet Committees on Economic Recovery and Investment, Housing and the Environment and Climate Change, as well as associated senior officials groups. As part of the Division's work, the Economic Development Unit's work is currently focused on development of an economic recovery plan, uh, which will be finalised um, shortly. This will set out our approach to a jobs-rich recovery with a particular focus on digitalisation and decarbonisation. The unit also leads work on the development of a well-being framework uh, for Ireland. This seeks to move beyond using uniquely economic measures to gauge our progress as a country uh, to a more holistic approach which encompasses broader living standards. The Housing, Infrastructure and Digital Unit supports the work of the Cabinet Committee on Housing as well as contributing to cross-departmental work in areas such as infrastructure, balanced regional development and digital um, policy. In relation to the Cabinet Committee on Housing, it last met on the 15th of April and is scheduled to meet again on the 10th of June. This committee works to ensure a coordinated approach to the delivery of programme for government commitments regarding housing and related matters. There is significant work underway on these commitments across government departments and agencies, including preparation of the new multi-annual Housing for All um, strategy. Progress has also been made on legislation to increase the availability and supply of affordable quality homes, including the Land Development Agency Bill and the Affording Affordable Housing Bill. This is supported by the provision of over three billion for housing initiatives this year, which will fund delivery of 12,750 social homes, the new cost rental uh, scheme, the equity loan scheme, and the expansion of the Rebuilding Ireland Home Loan, as well as the service sites and local infrastructure housing activation funds. More broadly, the work of the Economic Division also includes leading Ireland's participation at the annual European semester process, liaising with the Central Statistics Office, and providing me with briefing and speech material on economic and related policy issues. Thank you, Taoiseach. Uh, we go firstly to Deputy Park McLaughlin. Uh, Taoiseach, thousands of family homes uh, in Donegal are literally falling apart due to reckless practices in the industry in the 2000s. There was a huge housing boom and self-regulation was the order of the day. Now, in the case of Pyrite, the state stepped up, put in place the Pyrite remediation scheme, and that's fully funded 100%, and so it should be. But in Donegal and Mayo, the families there had been asked to step up and make 10% available, and the banks were supposed to help. Now, that was second-class citizenship, but it's got even worse a year on. Now it's as much as 50% of the cost of making their homes safe. What we're demanding in Donegal is equal citizenship. Our people whose lives have been devastated are asking for a fully funded 100% redress scheme, the same as the families in Dublin and North Leinster. Tisha, I'm appealing to you to listen to the stories, the heartbreak and despair coming from Donegal and do what's right by our people. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Alan Kelly now, please. These are three things. Your announcement that you made yesterday in relation to housing, you've taken on board what we've said in relation to stamp duty. I just don't know why you went with 10%, to be honest. I think you've missed it. It should have been 15% uh, at least. And why it doesn't apply, uh, why you're coming in at 10 homes and why it isn't a lower figure, I don't understand that. And I also don't understand genuinely the three month transition period. Um, I want to raise two other issues with you. Uh, since we last spoke about when I raised the issues in relation to Bor Pranada, in relation to uh, SHDs, another 300 departments in Dublin's Docklands have gone because, quote, in the justice uh, at the time, the judge, he said, of the laxity in relation to uh, ABP's work. What can we do? 
And finally, I would just ask you to give us some indication as regards Ireland 2040 and the planning framework. This is going to cause war across Ireland. It's going to be one of the biggest headaches you'll face in a year. So get ahead of it. I'm saying it quite all, a lot of the county development plans have been done now in relation to housing proposals. The idea that some people in some areas will actually be open and be able to get uh, planning for a house, but then be told, by the way, the year you'll get it is 2027, 2028. That can't work. Just can't work. And we additionally have the infrastructural issues relating to water and waste, which obviously I know quite an amount about. So please, what are your thoughts in relation to where we're going with Ireland 2040 and the planning framework as well, which needs to be completely changed as currently constituted by the previous government? Pete? Yeah, Corda. Um, I, I don't think it's an accident that housing policy of this government and the last couple of governments and many governments before that have not solved the housing crisis, have not addressed the needs of ordinary people, but instead have lined the pockets of developers, uh, speculators and investment funds. And I put it to you, Taoiseach, is that's because housing policy has been captured by those uh, interests. Um, we've seen lots of revelations about how they, they win on both sides of the equation. The state, through ISAF, invests in the investment funds, they get to buy up the properties, and then they lease it back to uh, the councils. But I want, I want to give you another example, which is the example of HAP. 40% of the HAP budget is going to corporate landlords or investment funds. 128 million in 2019. Um, corporate landlords are responsible for 4% of total private tenancies, but 40% of the HAP budget is going into the hands of these corporate uh, landlords. This is effectively a gold mine. They get a guaranteed rent from the state, plus a built-in rent increase of 4% every single year because of how the rent, the supposed rent control uh, legislation is written. It's an even better deal for them than the social housing leases currently being advertised to uh, investment funds. So, Tisha, would you not agree that a crucial part of addressing this is to introduce proper rent controls, which doesn't in, don't include these sort of rent increases? Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Keen O'Callaghan. Sir Margaret, Taoiseach, it's abundantly clear at this point that the government supports 100% of new build apartments being sold off to investment funds. That's been made, made very clear by the government over the last couple of weeks, and especially uh, with the proposals announced last night. So why is it uh, that the government does not support home ownership for smaller households, for individuals, for older couples who maybe want to move out of a family home uh, into a, an apartment but don't want to rent? Why is the government opposed to home ownership uh, for, the, for people who want it in, in our cities and in apartments? Taoiseach, are you aware that this morning the share price of the largest REIT in Ireland went up by about 4% in reaction to the announcements last night? Went up by 4%. That's what the stock markets think about your proposals. And can I ask you if you're serious about tackling investment funds, and I don't think there's any indication that the government is, if you're serious about tackling investment funds and the dominant roles they're playing, and remember last year in terms of the number of homes that were available for purchase to individual buyers, when you take out the one-off houses and you take out uh, various other schemes, about half of the new build homes last year went to uh, investment funds with the other half being available in the open market. If you're serious about that, would you not tackle uh, rents and rent levels and new bills so that investment funds wouldn't get such a high return, it would give people a fair chance in terms of rent, and would give people who want to buy a fair chance? Thank you. Deputy, Deputy Mick Barry. Uh, a home is a home whether it's an apartment or a house, so says MEP Kieran Cuff of the Green Party. The only pity is that the Green Party say that, but they don't vote along uh, the line that would follow from that. Um, it's hot air. Uh, or the Greens have a chance to show us tonight uh, uh, they can vote according to what was said there. Uh, we'll, we'll see, keep a close eye on that. What a concession, what a concession, Taoiseach, that you've made to uh, uh, the vulture funds. By not by excluding apartments entirely from the legislation. 
because that's where the big money is. Seven billion euro of institutional capital chasing the purchase of apartments. In 2017, 40% of all new apartments in the state being bought up by these funds. So are the first time buyers, are the young people who want to get into the market and buy, buy an apartment for a home for themselves and their family? Are they not being squeezed out of the market by the vultures? Why do you let the vultures off the hook so completely by excluding the apartment sector entirely from this? I put it to you that it's a huge let off for the vultures that you're giving them. Deputy Taoiseach, please to conclude. First of all, Deputy uh, O'Loughlin raised the issue that was raised in the Doyle yesterday as well, and I've spoken to Minister McConnell Logan in relation to this as well, and I believe Minister O'Brien is meeting with uh, the group shortly and invited them in February when he met them for a submission which he got at the end of April. Uh, but I do think it's important to say that the government uh, has responded uh, strongly to the MICA issue in Donegal in terms of the allocation of funding, uh, very substantial funding and grants are available under the five remedial options from about 49,500 to 247,500 and about 20 million is available in 2021 in relation to that. Um, now, as you, as you say, the, the, you know, with, with thousands of homes affected, it's actually, the state essentially has committed to about a billion between now and 2030. Uh, in relation to, to, to this scheme. So this is a very substantial commitment by the state uh, and I think that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, and um, in terms of the broader issue and the submission, uh, the minister um, will engage. Grant levels, as you say, have in the, in the scheme that was developed um, initially was capped at 90% um, of estimated costs, depending on the remediation option chosen. And as I said, vary from 49 to 247. The average cost on the East Coast Pirate Scheme is less than 70,000 um, per home. So the defective concrete blocks grant scheme costs in Donegal and, Mike and in, in, in Donegal and Mayo uh, is likely to be at least double that. So you're looking at a far more substantial allocation to each home in Donegal than you would have had in the pirate situation. So, that, so they're not comparable. Um, and it's not, I don't think you're comparing like with like in that regard. That said, the minister will engage with the the group representing um, the households um, and, will, and, and is examining their, their, their submission uh, that, that has been uh, made in relation to them. And there are issues here that genuinely have to be explored with the group um, uh, and, and with representatives um, across the board um, as, as well. As you know, there's, there's been a lot of work already prior to this government being formed in terms of an expert panel being established and so on that led to the creation of the scheme uh, and there was ongoing work with um, groups representing the, 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 the householders affected prior to the design of the scheme um, um, itself. So I don't think we're comparing like with like in terms of the, the, the two schemes. Um, the, I think the issue has been raised by Deputy Kelly in terms of board planola uh, and I think we need more resources uh, for board planola and we do need to look at that issue of the overall planning situation. Uh, planning court, for example, has been mooted and we have to see in terms of developing that. But we do need a more streamlined, uh, effective, more resilient and robust to challenge planning um, system. Deputy Murphy raised issues in terms of, um, again, the, the funds. And government is in hock to nobody. Um, and government has no agenda in promoting any particular group in society, fund or whatever. The only objective is to get houses and apartments built and to get a variety of housing and apartment for home ownership, for social housing, for affordable housing, uh, cost rental. Uh, there will be a rental market, there'll be a home ownership market. Uh, and government has, has initiated a whole range of proposals, all of which you oppose, from the affordable housing bill uh, to the shared equity scheme to the um, land development agency bill, all of which will provide housing. Um, and all of you seem to be against mixed housing developments. So this morning, the minister is launching and, and digging the sod on, the, on a 1200 scheme. It's a mixed development scheme. And it was held up for years because of opposition on the ground. But people out there need houses. People need social houses. People need to be in a position to buy houses. And people need to be in a position to buy apartments. 
And we support uh, families uh, and young people and people generally getting access to, and getting into a position to afford a parliament. But there is an issue with the viability around building par apartments for sale in, in Dublin in particular. And the, and, and, and the country does need capital to develop some of these markets. The capital has to be there. Uh, uh, government will not be able to build you know, the 40, 000, all of the 40,000 houses that are required every year. Um, uh, according to your, you know, in terms of what the ESRI is saying, 33,000, given the impact of COVID-19 uh, last year and this year, I think that could be a higher figure uh, over the next while that will be required. Uh, government will not be in a position to provide all of that housing, and we will need capital to provide some of it. Um, and particularly, there will be apartments that are needed for rent. Uh, if we took some of the initiatives that the deputies are suggesting, we would reduce the number of apartments which would put a further squeeze on the capacity of people to buy apartments. Um, so I don't get coherence or logic from, from what's being proposed um, on, on the other side. Thank you, Time is up.